just want to speak uh, on a, a few verses in Second Kings chapter three. Now, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the, the ver- I just read some of the verses as we go through the message that I'm going to measure on this morning. But just a little background uh, and resume of the chapter. We find that Ahab, uh, king of Israel, had died, and his son Jehoram was now on the throne. And then there was a king of Moab um, there, and it's a row over paying tribute taxes. So we find that uh, rebelled, Moab rebelled against the king of Israel, and that uh, the king of Israel then sent a message to Jehoshaphat, uh, king of Judah, and they began to call in reinforcements to help against this rebellion of the Moabites. And that's sort of briefly what the whole uh, saga is about. And he also supplied chariots and horses uh, for, the, uh, for the fight against uh, Moab. So the king of Edom also joined the forces with them. So we find here, we, the story is really about three kings, uh, king of Israel, Judah, and Edom. And they united against a common enemy. And they were traveling about a week when disaster struck. And they were coming up against the king of Moab to try to fight the rebellion. And in verse 9 of chapter 3 in in Kings, it says, And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals. Now, this was a serious situation. And I'm sure that they weren't foolish enough to set off into the wilderness in a battle without water, but they didn't take enough in reserve. Uh, they maybe, maybe they underestimated the intensity of the heat or the long, arduous journey or some of the hard barren conditions. We don't know, but we, all we know is that their water supply dried up. And that's a serious situation. It's not good when we let our water supply dry up. We need the water of the river of life and we need to keep it flowing within our beings. And somehow here, to make matters worse, the king of Israel, who should have known better, he blames God, and uh, said, oh, God has brought us out into the wilderness here to kill us. That was his first reaction. That wonderful reaction from the the king of God's chosen people. So it's any wonder, because he was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. They had discontinued Baal worship, but uh, they still compromised, and they kept other forms of idolatry. So we find he was running on a mixture, and it's not good to run on a mixture. Uh, you try putting petrol and, and diesel into the same car and you know all about it. It doesn't take you very far. And today we have a lot of people running on a mixture. We need to keep the water of life pure within our beings. And uh, when we do and stuff happens, sometimes we tend to blame God when it's not God's fault at all. And you see, this wasn't God's fault this time. It wasn't even the enemy's fault. Sometimes we blame the devil for things that we do in our foolishness ourselves. Uh, they simply had not taken enough water. And uh, surely we're living in a day and age when there's so many who are going without water or else going on a mixture, enough to get through maybe the next sermon, maybe enough to get through the next Sunday school lesson, enough to get through the next youth uh, meeting or the next worship service, the next song they're going to sing, but somehow nothing in reserve. And I believe God wants us to minister out of our overflow. That's what he wants. We need to have, be full and running over. Remember the little children's chorus, my cup's full and running over. Uh, well, people of my age will remember it. Young people probably won't, but my cup's full and running over. And uh, we need to be full and running over with the river of life. We need to have enough in uh, reserve and minister out of our overflow. And uh, you see, God's living water is not, in short, supply. Often our hunger is. Now we know we came through a period of two and a half years when most of that time our churches were in lockdown. But could I just say now, God's living water was not in lockdown. His living water is not in short supply. So how do we access that living water in a time, an unprecedented time we've had over this last couple of years, how do we access that living water? How do we keep flowing in the inside and overflowing so that we have enough to give to others? Not just when we're preaching, not just when we're doing our stuff in church, but a day to day, how do we have enough? And there's a needy, hurting person about that we have enough to reach out and give them. Well, let's see what these three kings did, and maybe we can take some uh, clues from it. First of all, they sought out the word of the Lord. Initially, uh, the king of Israel was crying defeat. As I said, king of Edom, he just kept stum. 
But Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, he made a wonderful suggestion. And he was the only king among them who faithfully served the Lord God Jehovah. So he turned to them and he said to them, in the middle of this odd barren desert, no water, everybody was fainting, everybody was really at their last legs as it were. And he turned to them and he said, guys, let's ask God. What a novel idea. I tell you, we laugh, but, you know, there's a lot of people today and that just never seems to enter their, their mentality. Let's go to God rather than cry to everybody else but God. We need to go to the people of God, yes. We need to go and, and, and get help and get prayer. And these, these guys did that. But we need to learn how to ask God. That must be our first port of call. Whatever happens, that must be our first port of call to ask God. I remember when lockdown first came. Remember the early, early days of lockdown when fear just filled the world? And uh, you're nearly scared to put your nose out the door in case the COVID police would come around looking for you. And uh, I remember going into my prayer cabin that we have at the bottom of, the, of our, our home and uh, just going in and, and somehow you heard the word lockdown and it seemed you nearly felt the chains of the, of, of the prison we were going to be going into. And I remember just going to God and I said, Lord, I don't know what's happening anymore. None of us know what's happening in the world. And at that point we wondered, would we ever be out again? Would things ever be normal but I remember just saying, God, you're still the same. Oh, Sakabara, hand of us, Sunday. You are still the same. And I need you more than ever now. And I had uh, amazing times with God during that time of lockdown when we, our diary was filled for maybe the year, two years ahead, and suddenly it was just empty overnight. And all leaders and preachers went through the same. But rather than the panic, I said, God, you're still here. We have still access to the living water. You are still here. And that's what we need to do. And uh, you see, King Jehoram, he was king over Israel. That was God's chosen people. And yet this thought had never crossed his mind that maybe he could ask God. And you see, for, for us, it's not rocket science. He knew, he knew the source of all power was God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew the source of all power was the, the Lord God, Jehovah, the God of the whole earth. You can't go higher than that, can you? So we need to go to the highest, the highest source that there is. And uh, he said then, um, is there not a prophet of the Lord here? Have we not somewhere got a prophet of the Lord? Is the word of the Lord not around? So one of the servants knew, he obviously knew this, and he piped up and he said, well, there's Elisha. And that, of course, we know is Elijah's successor. And just, God is just putting something in my spirit right now for Neil. And you have run along with your dad for years, and you'll still run for whatever time God has, longer than maybe we think. But when you run, there'll come a moment when you're getting the mantle and it's ready. you're ready running together and you're catching, you have your daddy's anointing. I saw you up there this morning. I saw you, oh, Kora Basandai. I saw your dad's mantle upon you. And uh, that doesn't mean your dad's going anywhere anytime soon. It means that you're running together because that's in a, in a race. We run together and then there's a handing over then at a certain point, a strategic point, that will come because the word of the Lord, yes, thank God there's somebody and thank God for a pastor here you've had for years and the word of the Lord is with him, both in, in preaching and in prophesying, both the Logos and the Rima, the word of the Lord is in his mouth. Not only the people here know that, but people right across different countries and across the, the, the land of Ireland know the word of the Lord is in his mouth, but the word of the Lord is in you. And it's going to come stronger and stronger and stronger as you minister the word and as you move out in the rhema word of God. There's something very special about what God has been training you up for. Okay? And, and of course, alongside Joanna. And uh, here we find that, uh, he, that this guy was Elijah, Elijah, Elijah's successor, I should say. So Jehoshaphat turned and said immediately, the word of the Lord is with him. Isn't that lovely? When someone can say of somebody else, the word of the Lord is with him. And not only just from talking about, not even just talking about public prophetic words or individual prophetic words, but as we live, we need to live prophetic lives that people know that the word of the Lord is with her. The word of the Lord is with him. They're carrying the word of the Lord. And there's a word in season whenever it's needed. And thank God, say for a church where your pastors both are carrying the word of the Lord. So we find here that the three kings then tripped down to wherever Elisha was. It doesn't tell us where he was. One of them served the living God. One of them was a, a backslider. And uh, the other was a rank heathen. What a mixture. But they went with one unified purpose. And that's to hear the word of the Lord. And can I just say, put the word of the Lord first 
and your whole priorities. You need the word of the Lord to be in your heart, first of all, in your mind, in your spirit, and then in your mouth. Carry the word of the Lord. It's not so much as what we do or what we say. It's what we carry. And we need to carry the word of the Lord within us. And that out of the overflow of what we carry will come uh, the word to many needy, hurting, hurting people who need a drink of that precious word. So that's the first one. Make the word of the Lord first port of call. Number two, they obeyed the word. See, it's one thing hearing what God's word says and receiving a word from God. It's another thing altogether obeying that word. And that is so important. Some people uh, go and want a word from somebody and a word from somebody. I'm sure Pastor Joseph has said this over the years. And there are those who do take it and run with it. And it's amazing. And it gives such delight to those who give the word. There's others who just don't don't, don't even heed it at all. They just tingles their ears and away they go. We need to obey the word because we need to make a difference in this life. And we'll only do it as we receive his word and as we obey that word. And uh, the word of the Lord to these three kings was something they did not expect. And they did not anticipate. They felt, well, go, this is the man that carries the word of the Lord. And they remembered Elijah before him. They remembered Elisha now. She's just starting out in ministry. And he's carrying the same word of the Lord. And they thought, well, we're getting a big prophetic word. And suddenly water will gush out. And suddenly the rain will come and the wind will come and everything else will happen. And it will be such torrential rain will hardly get back to where the army was. That is not what happened. Far from it. God, uh, through Elijah, God said to them, make this valley full of ditches. Now, if you're from the country or from a farming uh, background like I am, you'd know a ditch is a shock. <laughs> And the Ulster Scots, it's a shock. It's like in the dictionary, I didn't know this in the Ulster Scots dictionary. didn't know too recently, it was in the dictionary. But we always knew it was a shock. And we were farmers before we were pastors. And uh, I remember many a time Robert would go out uh, once a year. And he would, because we lived in an area of outstanding scenic beauty, they called it up at Slemish Mountain. And Mandy knows it very well. Been there many times. And uh, we find that tourists would come and park and have a picnic. And everything was just tipped over into the field over the hedge, and uh, it was amazing, weird and wonderful stuff that Robert used to get when he was cleaning out the shucks. He would say every, every spring, I'm going to clean out the shucks uh, or the ditches. Uh, that's a cavity at the end of a field that takes the water so that the field doesn't get waterlogged when you come to sow the crops and make hay and silage and everything else. It's so necessary, and uh, that's a, a job that every farmer does annually. Uh, so we need to clean out the shucks, folks. Lots of stuff can gather in our lives especially during this last few years when it's difficult. There's so many things can, can gather in people's lives of fear and intimidation and what ifs and, and weakness and sickness and, and so many things can gather in our shucks, in our ditches. So we need to let God clean them out, first of all, before water can uh, come in or else the water will just run over and they'll not, it'll spill out and not be any use to us. And you see, in the burning heat of the desert that day, these, these folks were tired. They were weak, they were weary, and these three kings knew they had to go back to them expecting to say water's, uh, rain's coming uh, and water's coming. And they knew they had to go back to say, well, guys, we need to get out the spades. We need to start to dig ditches. That was the last thing they wanted to hear. They had the strength even to do it. And I'm sure the army, when they went back, thought to them, this is not what we signed up for. Did you ever uh, be finding yourself in ministry and think, well, I didn't sign up for this, Lord? Many a time I said that to God over the years, then God reminded me, oh, you did. Took me back when I was 19 when I said, Lord, take everything there is of me. I was saved as a wee girl of six. Now, take my life. Anything you want to do, I'm yours. We forget those things, don't we? And we want to think, well, I didn't sign up for this. Many a thing and many a path God takes us on needle that we haven't signed up for. But we know that God has been there. God doesn't give you the whole picture because he knows we probably wouldn't say yes. But God gives us what we need to know to get us to the next stage. So in the back they went to the army, and uh, you know, they hadn't spades with them. They, they weren't going for construction work. They were going to fight a war. They had their arrows, they had their swords, they had their shields, they had their, 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 their tools of warfare. But they didn't have uh, spades and diggers and, and JCBs and you name it. They hadn't got it. So I have often wondered, I sometimes would like to know a bit more. God gives us, uh, uh, we, want, we want the small print and God will just give us the, the headlines. <laughs> And uh, 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 the headlines were, you've got to go and dig ditches. But how? And I've often wondered, Lord, how did they dig those ditches? 
because did they take the end of their spears? What did they do in the hard, cracked, barren land? How in the world did they dig ditches enough to hold enough water? I don't know. It doesn't tell us that, but we know it happened and it was successful. So um, we find here that, uh, you know, we, they thought, those three kings, I'm sure, thought, well, Elisha will do just what Elijah did. He'll, he'll come out and he, he'll pray over us and he'll say, he'll do a pastor Joe Curry, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> And uh, there's going to be water. And what he did say, yes, there's not going to be wind or rain, but there's going to be water, but it's not going to come the natural way. And he just said to them, get out the spades, dig the ditches. So how in the world they did it, I don't know. But I would like to ask that when I get to heaven. How did you dig the ditches in the wilderness of Edom without any proper tools? Uh, but they thought he just would call down from heaven, and that would, that would be, and it's the same with us. We go for a word and we think God will just come and he'll give us the word and suddenly the miracle will happen. And uh, you see, I I believe in the prophetic. And uh, I know this church so much believes in the prophetic. And and this prophetic content through every bone of my body. But a prophetic word does not seal and sign and deliver your miracle. We need to obey the word we get. Put it into practice. Do what God asks us to do and then the answer will come and the word will come into place. You see, God is so willing to bring the water. He wants us to be filled with his Holy Ghost in a new way. He longs to release that water to us. But are we willing to do what God wants us to do in order to receive it? Many people expect God to bring what they ask for without any cooperation in their part at all. See, in Scripture, if you look back, you'll see there are very, very few times that God answers that way. The majority of answers, and I found in my experience, the majority of answers come with God giving us a strategy that when we, when we uh, obey and cooperate with God, then we receive the answer. And in this story, uh, the first, thus saith the Lord, God told them what they had to do, and that's in verse 16. And then in verse 17, the second, thus saith the Lord, God tells them what he was going to do. So very often he tells us what he expects us to do, and then he comes and He then moves in. I I always believe if we do what we can do, God will do what we cannot do. And uh, sometimes we forget that. And uh, he says, no wind, no rain, uh, no signs, no evidence. Uh, It's going to be miraculous. Now, all they had as they walked back or got on their horses and headed back to the rest of the army, all they had was the fact that this word from Elisha said, thus saith the Lord. There's going to be rain. It's going to happen, but you have to dig ditches. That's all they knew to do at the beginning. They didn't know how it was going to happen other than dig ditches. Make a place for the water to rest. And we need to make cavities within us and within our inner being that his living water can come and can not only dwell within us but move out and the overflow through us to others. But we need to make room for those, the, the water to come, make room within our lives to hear from God, to obey God, and to do what he wants. So they sought out the word of the Lord, and then they obeyed that word. Those are the two important things. But number three, and I love this, they worshipped. And I love this church because it's a church of worship. Joanna, thank you again for the anointed leading and for your team. Uh, It was just so easy. It just brings the word out of you through that worship. And uh, that's not everywhere. Every church that says they're Pentecostal doesn't be Pentecostal, I tell you. Uh, We need to live in a way that we have the living water moving within us and that the worship was just so precious this morning. Verse 20, it says, Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by the way of Edom and the land was filled with water. All the cavities were now filled up that they had made. They had dug and they had dug. And how they did it, I don't know. In their weakness, they did it. And all those cavities that they made and the ditches that they made at the side of all the, the hard, barren land were filled with water. But notice this. It came, the water came after the sacrifice was offered. You see, the Holy Spirit is released to us after we release ourselves to him in worship. It's so important. Worship is so important. Worship brings God's presence. It makes way for the word, both the, the, the spoken word and the prophetic word. It makes way for God to bring the miraculous in our lives. But we must remember, worship is the key. It's so important. And um, the, the miracle came at the place of worship. And I love that. That's when the, mir- the, the miracle came. It happened in the morning. 
for that whole night to wait. <laughs> They'd come home that day, uh, back that day from, from Elisha, and they said, we have to, guys, we have to dig ditches. And I'm sure there were some uh, remonstrating with uh, these kings, but they did it. And they were weak, they were tired, they went that lay down that night, and they're, that the hard cracked ground, and they were still no sign of a miracle. No evidence that God even was in the, the whole situation. And I'm sure the word rose up to mock them. They had done it. They had they'd, they'd worked. And in their weakness, they had managed to get these cavities made, these ditches made. And there was still nothing. Absolutely nothing. Zero. And the miracle, it seemed like it wasn't going to happen. Have you been in a place when you've prayed and you've sought God and you've prayed some more and somehow it doesn't seem to be happening? But we're just as as badly off as we were. There's no sign of a miracle, no evidence of, of, of water, no evidence of rain coming, no evidence of an answer to prayer. And we lie down when we're weary and tired in the evening times of our, our day. And we think, Lord, it didn't happen. I'm sure we have all been there. I've been there many times. But it says it happened in the morning. And do you remember the old song? Some of you young ones not maybe remember it, but it was, Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping only lasts for the night. But hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning because the darkest hour means that God is just in sight. And that, I believe, we need to hold on in the darkness through the lack of, of answered prayers, through, through all this stuff. And we had a very difficult time in lockdown. Our, our youngest daughter is a wheelchair user. Mandy knows her well. And uh, she went through, I'm not going into all the details, but we almost lost her. And I ended up having to carry her from the bed to the toilet to the wheelchair. Uh, Robert could do the, the other stuff. I, he couldn't do the toilet bit. And I pulled muscles in my, my chest with lifting her. Uh, heavy weight, floor level. She couldn't even put her calipers on. Uh, things were so bad. And uh, there was some, that, that was an awful time. And it, it seemed dark. And there was times that I remember just going back to God and saying, God, I don't understand you, but I still love you. And I found when I was younger, I thought, I thought you know, I knew everything. <laughs> and then when I got a bit older, I knew I didn't know just so much. And now I think, do I know anything at all? <laughs> and uh, sometimes we were kept waiting for the answer. And it seems almost like the opposite would happen. And uh, we were, I was uh, looking after her and getting her back into to bed. And then we were booked to go on a Zoom meeting. We Zoomed for the, the year and a half. We were Zoomed out. But... Um, back and, and, and God would come and anoint me again as I preached in Zoom. As soon as the Zoom was over, I had to go back down. And she was lying listless in the bed, needing more help. And it was so hard to understand. I remember saying one day, God, I feel that I'm more than broken. But I just want you to know, should you never answer, I'll still love you and I'll serve you while there's breath in my body. That's the resilience we need in the dark times. And especially if you're in the front line of what God's doing, uh, you get all the the arrows, I can tell you. But we need to just keep resilient and keep believing God that he is still the same. And this is what happened. When that night it was dark, the darkness had come, the night had come, and there was no sign, a, not a whisper of, of anything as evidence at all. But didn't God say to them, you'll not see wind and you'll not see rain, but the valley shall be full of water. And uh, did you ever see a, 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 a flooding anywhere without wind and rain? And then coming down in buckets and raining cats and dogs, as we say here in this, in this land. There was no raining there of any type. It was just in the morning, suddenly in the morning. And I think this is wonderful when the grain offering was offered. Still weak, and they were still thirsty, still no answers, still not a sign when they rose that morning that God had even heard their cry. What did they do? <laughs> What did they do? They worshipped. I, I, I wept over this many times. They worshipped. In their weakness, in, in what it looked like, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's ever going to happen. It hasn't happened. We're worse than ever. We've done all that God asked us to do. And I'm sure they reeled on those three kings. And there's not a sign that God's in the situation. But they put up the morning sacrifice, as usual. They worshipped. Away from home, but they still worshipped. Away from all the times when they went in the different seasons and the different times of the day to do their sacrifices, they were away and they still worshipped. In the middle of the, the darkness, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of all that stuff, they still worshipped. And then it says, in the morning when the green offering was offered, that suddenly water came. Oh, suddenly water came. I love that. 
This is one of God's suddenlies, but sometimes we wait a mighty long time to get his suddenly. I have found anyway, and here it was. After all of that, they were worshiping God through their weakness and their, their, their minds and everything. And then, oh, Sakabara Handai, suddenly, 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 water came while they worshiped. And I think that's absolutely amazing. So, when did it come? It came when they worshiped. How did it come? It came suddenly. And where did it come from? It came, it says, by the way, of the, the, the way of Edom, the land was filled with water. And that was the wilderness of Edom. That was the, the driest, most arid, most barren place it could have come from. But it came from the direction of where there couldn't possibly be any water. And do we not find sometimes that God comes, and there comes a moment when it seems that nothing's going to happen, and suddenly something comes, and we think, how did it come from there? How did God answer like that? It was the most unlikely person he would use, the most unlikely circumstances, the most unlikely situation, and suddenly the answer comes. Never, ever underestimate God. And I love the old uh, song that says, Let me find you in the desert until the sand is holy ground. And sometimes I have found, even in my desert experiences, in the burning heat of the stuff I've been walking through, and the, the oddness and the barrenness and the dryness, I found God. I just found him. And there's times that I um, slip down to the bottom of, uh, of our home to where the, my prayer cabin is. And uh, Robert would be there with, with Lisa. Just to get a minute or two on my own. Feeling dry. My heart broken. My heart broken. And here I am coming into my cabin. And I would just sit down and just weep before God. Give God your tears. Give God your pain. Give God your not understanding. Give God your fears. And I would just spill out to him. You know, the wonderful thing is he never turned me away. It says he, he loves, and he, he loves the prayers of people. And he's so near, he's nearer than breathing. And I would just say, oh God, you know. Didn't have to say anything more, but he, he knew. I said, oh God, you know. And as I would weep before him, he would come. He would come as a, Another song I love, come into the chamber, be free, Holy Spirit. Speak to me gently as I close the door. Heavenly lover, let thy presence cover. To kind of unending is all I long for. Let him be your lover. And I would, I would because I was so afraid that I would, I would get hard, and I would always say, but God, I, I still love you. I want you to know I still love you. I, I, I don't understand you, but I love you, and I'll always love you. And the times this past two years, even that I've said that to God, the times over the many years I've said it to God. And he comes. And I would just sit and weep in his presence. Weeping uh, to begin with for the situation and weeping for my wee girl. No matter how old they are, they're always your wee girl, aren't they? And uh, then I would weep because of his presence. I would weep in his presence. That old hymn, it says, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet their thorns compose? So it's a cry, and I would start to sing some of the old hymns, and he would come again. And I would go up again to look after Lisa with my heart full of his love and his strength and his peace. Peace in the midst of the storm. So what did the water do? It satisfied their thirst. And we need to drink and drink. The old hymn again, fill my cup, Lord. Let's lift it up, and he will quench the thirsting of our souls. Number two, it strengthened their bodies. They were now stronger physically. And number three, it duped the enemy. Towards the end of that chapter, verses 21 to 23, I'm going to read. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings had come to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older gathered together, and they stood at the border. That's the enemy waiting, waiting for them coming. Then they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water. That's the enemy. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now then, Moab, to the spoil. Let's go and get them. Let's go and get the spoil because the, the fighting is over. They've killed each other. They've killed themselves. And what an analogy here of Calvary. The sun shone on the water, making it look blood red. 
And the blood is again a symbol of Calvary that was to come. And the water is a symbol of the living water, the river of life, the Pentecostal flow of the Holy Spirit. And can I say, when the Son of Righteousness, the S-O-N of righteousness, shines upon us as we worship, that worship becomes blood red to the enemy. Because the enemy hates worship. That's why we need to worship. When we feel like it, when we don't feel like it, when we feel like doing anything else, we need to worship. Because why does he hate it so much? Because it reminds the devil of what he used to have and will never, ever, ever, ever have again. He was the worship leader in heaven who covered heaven's glory, uh, heaven's throne with glory. That was his remit. What a, a ministry. He covered heaven's all of heaven with his glory, covered the throne of God with his glory, next to God himself, an anointed cherub that covered, but that wasn't enough. And you know, he came out at high treason and was flung out of heaven and became the serpent, the devil. And from that moment, he hates worship. That's why he's tried to counterfeit it so many places over the world, counterfeit worship, demonic worship to the wrong source. That's why we need to worship more than ever. And I just was watching a wee clip there the other night of um, a Ukrainian church and they were worshipping. And this was somewhere where they were in the bunkers and they were worshipping. And I wept as I watched them and their hands were raised to God. And I didn't understand the language, but I sure understood the spiritual language as they worshipped Almighty God. And I thought, oh God, what a people, what precious people that we need to pray for and worship for them. And I worship now, I worship also for Ukraine. Every time I'm worshipping, I'm worshipping for Ukraine and the innocents and the, and the precious people in Russia that know God and love God. We need to pray for all of them and uh, worship. They know. They have learned something there that worship is the answer. Yes, we need to pray, but worship is the answer. And worship brings forth a prophetic. And so many people are, are finding God there. So many Russian soldiers are finding God and coming to Christ. Uh, this is the beginning of the end times. I say God knows what he's doing, and uh, there'll, be, there'll be victory. There will be victory. And we find here that uh, we have the blood, the symbol of Calvary, water, the symbol of the Holy Ghost, and mixed with worship. Do you remember back at the beginning of the chapter, I didn't read it for the sake of time, whenever Elisha went to give them the word, before he ever gave them the prophetic word, he says, get me a musician. I need a musician. I need worship. O Sakabara Handai. I need worship before I can deliver the word because worship calls forth the prophetic. And it was your worship this morning that called forth the prophetic in me even to deliver the word. It's something about worship that brings up the prophetic. Oh, Sakabahai. And it's so amazing. Uh, when he, and that's what Elisha knew that. And he said, first of all, I need a musician. I need worship to make way for the word. And whenever the musician played, suddenly... That the air and the atmosphere was transformed and uh, the word of God came. Make this valley full of ditches. Why? Because you'll not see wind nor rain nor any evidence but this land shall be filled with water. And away they went and that's all they had. And a whole day before then, it was the next morning before they saw the answer and sometimes God's delays are not his denials but we need uh, to have that worship. Worship wherever you can However you can, whenever you can, just worship. And sometimes, if I'm honest, we worship through clenched teeth. <laughs> we worship when we don't feel like doing it because the situation's so dire and our pain is so great and our sorrow is so great and our grief is so great and we don't feel like worshiping. But that's the time we need to do it more than ever. That sacrifice of praise that calls forth the word of God. And even in, the, in the, the New Testament, in the last day of the feast, uh, Jesus stood and this was the same principle here in the New Testament. And he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. This was the, the last day of the, the great assembly. Seven days they worshipped uh, and, and they made sacrifices and offered sacrifices for other nations. And the eighth day they stood and they offered sacrifices for their own people, for Israel. And uh, at the time of the morning sacrifice, again, it was the morning sacrifice here in the New Testament, the... Um, the uh, that they find that the priest went and he went to the pool of Siloam with a golden vessel and he drew water from that pool. And while that water was taken to the altar and was on the altar, he poured the water mingled with wine upon the sacrifice. There again is the symbol of the blood and the symbol of the living water of the Holy Ghost together. 
And it says what happens then, the people started singing with great joy. You see, sometimes we compartmentalize God's attributes and, and who he is. We say, well, there's salvation. That's the blood. And then we have the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And then we don't need that. We don't talk so much about Calvary. We go ahead and there's the Holy Spirit. It's all interlaced from Genesis right through the Old Testament. Symbolically speaking of a Calvary that was to come, you find symbols of the blood and the water. We saw that one in Kings when I was reading there. Here in the New Testament, again, it's still the symbol of the blood and the water. We need to remember that out of every bleeding wound, his glory flows. It's the blood and the water together that brings the glory of God. And the result was that day uh, in the New Testament, Jesus said, then if you do that, as he stood up, and if anyone thirst, let him come to me. And then he said, out of his belly, the living water will flow out of our innermost being. That's the seat of our intellect and the seat of our emotions and our desires. The living water shall flow. And that's what is so, so important. And uh, lastly, it gave them the victory. That was the last thing it did. It gave them the victory. Verse 20, And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too intense for him, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom. And I love the last four words. But they could not. They tried, but they could not. They thought all they had to do was go and take the spoil, but they discovered something very different. And they, 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 the God's people, they won the battle and they could not, the king of Edom could not, or the king of Moab could not break through. And of course, he went on to offer his son, and that's another story in another sermon for another day, uh, as a living sacrifice. Uh, and it was a cursed thing, uh, totally, totally against the, the, the mind of God. It says they tried, but they could not. And he was so discouraged, that's what he did. And you see, there was the word, there was the obedience, and there was worship, and then there was the victory. And we need to keep that a river of God flowing in our lives again and again and again. And I remember as a, as a young girl, and I uh, uh, belonged to a Pentecostal church, but in those days uh, there wasn't much Pentecost about it. That was a, went through a, a barren time. That has, over the years has changed, but then it wasn't really Pentecostal by its practice. And my heart, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost when I was 19, and I'll never forget that night. Uh, my father was a pastor, and we were just visiting a home of one of the elders, and the elder's wife had a real ministry in bringing people into the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I had given God everything in my life, and I just so wanted to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But I was too shy to say to my parents, you know, when your parents are the pastors, sometimes they're the last people you go to at that age. And uh, she, the, the, the elder's wife noticed, and she knew, picked up on her spirit, and she came over. She saw the anointing upon me, and she just said, let it come. Tongues are on your head there. I see them over your head. Let it come. And that night, I went home speaking in a language I had never learned. And there was such a hunger from that. And then there was times of dearth and different things that happened that there wasn't the same flow. And then we heard about, uh, I'm sure Pastor Joe has heard of them too, away back in those early years. I think maybe it was about Lisbon. I'm not sure. But there were, there were the glory people that came over from Scotland, the Camerons, the singing Camerons. And Roy Turner he used to sing about the dancing heart. And I remember... We couldn't drive at that time, and uh, we paid between us for a taxi to go uh, to that town uh, to, uh, to these glory meetings. And uh, God did something. And I remember uh, we went then every week, and we either got a lift with somebody or we paid for a taxi, whatever it was. And oh, my heart was so full. And I, I, just, I was so thirsty. And I just went every week, and I drank, and I drank, and I drank. And I remember one Sunday morning going into a home church, and... Uh, one of the elders, or the men in grey, as we used to call them, <laughs> uh, said out loud so I would hear it, Oh, here comes the glory woman. Now, that was not meant as a compliment, let me tell you. And I was embarrassed. As a teenager, I was embarrassed. Did I stop going, Neil? Ha, 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 ha. No. Every week. And then different times of outpourings later on. And every time there was a, a chance for God's glory and God's power and God's anointing, I was there. I was in there. And that's what's kept me all these years. It was those glory meetings. It was those times when I went, when I could, where there was any of God's anointing and refreshing. You might say, well, was it all, was it all real? I'm sure there's a mixture. I'm sure there are times. Because I remember somebody say once, I would rather have real fire and a bit of wildfire than no fire. 
And I think this Pentecostal church has been thrown out everything, the baby with the bathwater, and end up with no fire. He'll exclude it, of course, in people, places like this. And so many times, leaders are so afraid of the wildfire. And you'll all, before you've got flesh, you'll get wildfire. But go for the real, and God will take care of you. And it's that, those times of, of glory, being a glory woman. And you know, I was embarrassed that, that morning as a teenager. But you know now, <laughs> the greatest compliment you could pay me is said she's a glory woman. I want to live and die a glory woman. Go for God's glory every time. Is Jolene here? No, I'll, I'll, I'll see you after. I'll get a message for her from God. I'll, I'll see you afterwards. But you know, let's go for God's glory. Let's go for the living water. And you're so privileged here to have a, a pastors who the, the word of God's in their mouth. And you've come for years to Pastor Joe. I'm thinking, well, you won't give me a word, and that's great. And he has many times he has done it. But, you know, could I say, obey what he brings. Thank God for what you have here. It's not everywhere. And we go around a lot of places, north and south and east and west, and uh, there are few and far between that carry that level of God's glory. Keep that burning. Keep the fire burning. And keep going to God in your own. And if you can't, uh, have the time to, now I have time, I can go into a prayer cabin and spend time. But in the early years, we were farmers, we were pastors, and we had three children, one of them with very, many special needs, who was in Musgrave Park more often than anywhere else. And I used to, as I was feeding the, 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 the animals, was going and, and praying and worshiping God, driving the tractor, and I would be going in tongues, feeding the pigs, and those pigs could grunt, they'd be grunt, talk, they'd be grunting in tongues. And uh, up ladders, painting the windows, listening to a wee walk. Remember the old walk? Well, you don't remember. You're too young, Joanna. The old Walkman tapes. And I'd have it in my pocket. And I'd be listening to the Word of God and those tapes. And it was the old English. In those days, it was, old, it was the King James. But it was the Word of God. I tell you, I was receiving and receiving and receiving. And uh, whenever you can't get the time to, a block of time, you can't say if you have children, now mommy's going to pray for two and a half hours now, so just you be good. You ain't going to work like that. But as we're working, as we're doing stuff, when Lisa uh, was in hospital, I would just be sitting beside her praying in tongues. I'd be up and down the corridors of, the, of Musgrave Park praying in tongues. And when she came home, she had to have physiotherapy every single day. And it took hours every day. And every lemon, every toe had to be gone over. And as I was doing that, I had a wee egg cup of Rabina and a wee bit of a cream cracker. And I was communing with God. And I was praying in tongues as I was doing it. And as I was putting oil in her wee joints, I would say, that I'm, I'm releasing this as your anointing oil upon her joints. And just making use of the time that you have. You, you can make ways. If you want to, to see a program, you'll see it. You, you, you tell me if you have a favorite program or you're in a sports, you'll see it. And, and the Northwest was on. My son-in-law was one of the commentators there. And, and, uh, uh, and our family loves to watch the Northwest. But if you're too busy for other things, you'll make sure if you're a, a motorbike uh, <laughs> person, you'll see. You'll make sure you see or you hear it in the radio. Or if you're whatever else you're into, you'll make sure that you get it. And so often we forget that we need to put the same amount of, of laboring into making sure we have time to spend with God and do it when you're doing stuff. And when I'm listening to some of that stuff, uh, and when Vic, Richard's voice was coming over the radio, I was working, I was making food, I was doing stuff. I wasn't sitting down, I hadn't the time, but I was able to do it. And you'll make way for the word if you're hungry enough and you're thirsty enough. And I ask and, and pray today that you will uh, seek out the word of the Lord in your life and then obey that word and then just worship. Just worship. And that will bring your miracle. Maybe not when you want it. Maybe not when you think it should come. God is still God. Amen. Thank you.